Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros podcast, first episode of 2021, and we're starting off with a bang, D'Anthony. A flashbang, maybe. Maybe. Uh, I like that pun a lot. You know I'm a punny guy. Uh, No, we've got uh, retired Command Sergeant Major Tom Satterley on the show today from... I I hate to keep saying Black Hawk Down because I'm sure you hear it all of the time, but... uh, you know, at this point, I, I think that's what a lot of people associate you with. Yeah. Sadly, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> it's not even my claim to fame. It's something I was just part of. So, Isn't that weird, man? Because we, look, we've had, you know, uh, like Rob O'Neill and, and uh, like uh, Marcus Luttrell is probably the best example, too. Marcus is a good buddy of ours. He's been on the show a million times. And everybody wants to talk about the worst day of your life Mm. do you get tired of answering that because it's like look i'm a civilian um dan dan uh served for for many years but um i'm a civilian but that's that's one of that's still the black hawk down stories is one of the most fascinating in war stories in american history yeah it it gets to one of those points where i feel like i'm rattling off the same story over and over again it's almost (laughs) You know, I mean, you do something repetitively, it's boring for you, though it might be exciting for somebody right. listening to you. It's like, there I was, running down the street, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's like, it's hard to find heart in it, telling a story, other than when I'm telling a story to try to help somebody with it, you know. But, yeah, it gets, uh, couldn't do it up front. Man, I couldn't even tell the story up front, you know, fully all the way through. I couldn't get through it. I, it's too painful. And then you do it over and over and over again. It's kind of cathartic to where you can finally tell the full story without breaking down and crying. You can actually get through it and find some meaning in it. Right. Um, has that been difficult? Because it was, it, it was a long time ago at this point. What are we looking at? Uh, 20 years. Uh, yeah. Longer than that. 93. 93. So. 93. 93 Holy yeah. shit. 27 years. 30. Yeah. Uh, God, man. I, this year, I feel like with, with COVID and everything that went on, <laughs> It all blends, like it's all a blur now in the past where it was just like, man, I'm trying to, earlier I was trying to remember like movies with my wife and things like that that I had seen. And it's, I feel like this COVID year added 10 years to everybody's life. It was 1993 at this point. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, right. I've been retired out of a 25 year career in the army, 10 years already. Wow. This month. And, I, and I, I did that on a radio show this morning. I was like, uh, how- you know, when did you retire? And I was like, oh, my, uh, 10 years ago this month. I was like, holy crap, what a shocker. I didn't even think about it. And COVID is like, when you say last week, uh-huh. you know, last week we went to a movie, really, that's like last year now. Yeah. It's been almost a year <clears throat> with this COVID, COVID thing. So everything I reference pre-COVID has been a year now. And, and it feels like it was last week when it started. So I, I feel you on that. I, you know what? I, thinking about it, I know why I said 20 years. I actually auditioned. I had a screen test for Black Hawk Down, the movie. Um <laughs> Now, with that, uh, that's, that's a true story, by the way. Uh, I met with uh, Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer, I believe, are the ones who did that film. And yeah. uh, to this day, all you guys say the same thing. That's one of the best portrayals mm. of, uh, of a military movie. Um, what are well, your I, thoughts I, I, on it? These, these days, you could find some competition for it. But back then, it was the only one that was even close to accurate on anything. Yeah. When I first met Jared to, to rewrite Range 15, he said the same thing. He goes, man, Black Hawk Down was the... That was the gold standard for military movies mm-hmm. at that time. Um, what did you think of, of the movie portrayal of that versus what went down in real life? You know, one thing I learned during the movie, and I saw it one time. I saw it with all my friends that went, that were there with us, you know, for the original filming. And they did a, pre, <laughs> they did, they did a pre-screening for us. So I saw it with all my friends. We're making fun of each other, you know, hey, that guy's doing something you did. You know, we had no idea because we didn't help with the making of it because we were still in. And it was, you know, it was one of those elbow kind of, that's funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I learned that I didn't know a lot about the battle. Mm. I, I, I saw this much, right? If, if I'm shooting you, I see you. If I, you know, I don't see what's going on six inches right and left, and that's somebody else's story. And so I learned so much that went on watching that movie for that one time and and since then i've tried to watch it a couple of times i can't get through it because it's too real for me um but i think it portrayed the chaos of what i saw um you know when you when you're watching a movie of what they're portraying about you it's kind of like uh you know is it real or not it's 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 a movie all of a sudden and it's different 
But I, you know, the other movies I think that chalked up with that were like Saving Private Ryan. I walked out of that opening scene from that. Um, that was too real for me to enjoy it as a movie. That was too close to uh, something I'd been in. So, you know, I get that some movies are entertaining and some are more realistic. And I think that one was kind of a, a realistic one with a lot of the humor stuff that you don't get to see in combat that goes down when we're all busting each other's balls when really they were scared to death, you know? Yeah. Um, now, what I had heard about the, the Black Hawk Down movie was that they combined uh, kind of, you know, real life people and, and mesh them into one. Did somebody play you specifically in that movie or was it the same type of deal where they had kind of meshed it into one character? Yeah, the same deal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good explanation of that. I've been trying to describe that like multiple people, you know, one actor did multiple acts <laughs> from different people. So a lot of guys could say, hey, I did that. And somebody else could say the same thing. Yeah, I, I did that. And right. so-and-so played you. I'm like, no, because he was a ranger in the movie. But he did some things that we did. You know, the stories that the rangers told that they witnessed and saw, you know, they had to incorporate into mm -hmm. an actor. So, yeah, that was uh, that was cool to watch it play out. And, and people kind of like, yeah, I get that story, even though a ranger was doing it in the movie. You know, a, a Delta guy might have done it in actual life. Um, can you describe what it was like on the day for, for real life? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I can't describe the chaos. I, I, there's no way. I mean, I can wrap it up in, in you're terrified. You know you're going to die. But you got to wait for it, right? It's kind of like I talk about my job. You know, the military guys in special ops, they're so lucky they have this job that if you don't die doing it today, you're lucky enough to get to try again tomorrow. You know, and every day of your life is like, hey, if I don't die, I get to come back tomorrow. Um, but it was uh, terrifying. And then I lost a lot that day. I lost a lot of, uh, I lost empathy and compassion for mankind. You know, I said, I bottled everything up that day and I held on to it and probably till about five years ago. And uh, I lost the thought at the time that we were invincible, all this training that we were doing and, oh, we're Delta, man. Nobody can touch us. And, and then you, you, you look over and, and you look at your friend, you look away less than 30 seconds later, you look back and his body's being drug away. And I remember at that moment, we're not invincible. I remember thinking, shit, man, I, I could die. I, I should never really thought that one through up until you see somebody get, you know, killed or injured. And uh, up until 3 October, combat had been what you think it would be like. You shoot at the bad guys, they die, you go home, you high five, you tell your stories, you, you know, you make fun of the bad guys and you go to bed and I wake up and do it again. And then you find yourself in a battle that's, you know, you feel like you're losing. You're on the losing end and you're terrified for your life and you want to go home and you can't. And they're still coming. So 18 hours of that, it was just one of those nights of uh, multiple life-changing events that just kind of shaped who I was the rest of my life. Yeah, I, I can imagine. it. And again, you know, shit, now that we tied down the year, I mean, 27 years ago, and, and, and again, everybody wants to talk about this story still every day. I apologize for bringing it up, but uh, there is a lot of people in the audience, um, especially a, a lot of guys who are, uh, going in or getting out now who, who just weren't alive um, for that in 1993, which is strange, right? 27 it's, it's years. It's certainly strange to me. Certainly adds a few uh, years to my mind. I'm like, I still think I'm a kid, right? Yeah. I can run around and do whatever I want. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm doing things that people that weren't born didn't want to talk about. Or I've got guys that are in combat with their sons now, you know? They'll go do a combat hit in Iraq with their son just so they can say they did it. And I'm like, wow. Um, We've come a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, that battle took place, the firefight, and it was in Mogadishu, Somalia. Um, that country clearly hasn't changed either. Uh, what do you Not look... Not well, yeah. If anything, it's gotten worse now because... Probably. I mean, what, Al-Shabaab's all over the place there now. Back then, it was disorganized to a large degree, and the warlords, whomever controlled the supply of guns was doing all right. Now it's just like abject chaos over there. I mean, if you... It, it's, there's, there's nobody in charge of shit over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, and you were, so Dan, you were in Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you were obviously in Somalia. Looking back at it, you know, knowing what the country is, what it is today, do you look at that of like, why the fuck were we there? Probably every time, you know? I mean, look at Iraq, the same thing. It's, yeah. 
You know, I, I, I do talks about it to special operations guys. I'm like, look, the world's not going to love you, man. You're going to have to love yourself because you go, you'll go around the world to try to help people that half of them hate you for it. The other half like you for it for about a week, maybe a month, and then they hate you. Everybody hates you and they want you out of their country. Thankless about you changing the power because they don't they don't have sewer or water or you know electricity so they blame you for it right. and then you come home to a country that's not shouldn't be patting you on the back for it because we volunteered for those jobs but do everything for everybody else in the world and never do anything for ourselves and it's just it's like this is one of those thankless jobs that make you bitter man it's uh I, that's why i ask um because of the bitterness of it again like let's say you know you go to somalia and you change the the country and the world and 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 all that stuff, and then you come back and you're like, shit, yes, that's what I was fighting for. Then you look at it and it was like you and Dan say, like it's a worse country now than it was 27 years ago. I can understand that, man. I, I, there's got to be more than bitterness and just hatred for fuck those people. Um, well, I mean, one would I've, imagine eventually you have to turn it into something positive, or you're going to end up like a lot of our friends end up, which is uh, blowing your fucking brains out or just a drunk piece of shit all the time. Right. Uh, like, if you can't turn that into some kind of, I, I'm, I, when I say activism, I don't necessarily mean the, what we think about these days, but if you can't turn that into something positive, you're going to have some problems, to be honest. And that's exactly where I was going with this, because I know you faced addiction to prescription drugs. Anybody that's uh, been in any fucking and- infantry or a special operations unit has a fucked up back and, a fuck, and fucked up knees and probably headaches. Everybody. Right. You know what I mean? So right. It, that, that is such a common refrain, to be honest. I don't know. Uh, you know, have you heard that they're starting to use ketamine now in lieu of oh, uh, yeah. in lieu of uh, like opiates yep. to treat pain? That's that's a pretty big thing, I think. Yeah, were you doing it to treat pain or to numb what had gone on in your life? Because I mean, there's there's even crazier stories in Black Hawk Down that we're going to get to in a second um, with with your career. Yeah, I think it was both. I mean, I'm I'm still in pain, but I got off of all the opioids because of the the length of time I'd been on it and what it was it was making me feel numb. Um, originally, it made me feel normal because I wasn't in pain. The only time I wasn't in pain was taking opioids. Then I realized I'm taking them all day, and then I realized, oh man, I'm I'm not feeling that way anymore. So I you know I needed it, and I'm, I weaned myself off one day, and I didn't even realize what was happening to me. The, the sickness I was going through, mm. the, the, the flu feeling. And I was like, damn, something's wrong with me. I'm like, oh, I haven't taken pain pills in like three or four days. I'm starting to feel really bad. And I just kind of weaned myself off because of that feeling. But, you know, changing my perspective helped me with that bitterness and helped me with I can deal with the pain a little bit instead of just trying to mellow into it. But, man, it, it turns a lot of people into, I mean, friends of mine, they're doing every drug they make, every illicit drug on the planet. This started with pain pills and and I'm working with them and didn't even know it. And then finally they come to me. I can't even pull the trigger anymore, man. I need some help. So we get him help and you know, he's doing great now, but over and over and over again, that story of here, take this, here, take this, here, take this. <clears throat> and it's, it's not one of those things where do I think what we did was worthless? And I'm not going to get into all that. Right. Cause you, you, I could argue with everybody everywhere on their idea of what worthless is and what we did. You know, it's perspective for me. Do I think we're fighting for money and someone else's fame and fortune? Shit always, right? Money's everything around the world. That's what makes everything tick. I don't care what you hide it behind. Um, But did I save, did we save hundreds of thousands of other lives that would have died by starvation? Sure. Have less died over the amount of time that would have died, you know, hopefully. I don't know. I don't stick around and do the math. I'm over screwing up some other buddies, some other country, you know, so... That's just kind of the job you signed up for. And, and to be honest, up until you get at a higher rank, I didn't even consider it. To me, it was just a job, and I did what I was told, and I did it well. Yeah. And then, you know, you grow up, and you're like, why was I there? I don't know. Do you do you regret it now? Well, it's, re- regret's always too late mm-hmm. for me. So I, I try not to have it. So it's like, yeah. Did I learn something along the way? Fuck yeah. Did I learn to help you not make the decisions I made? Sure. And will I try? Yes. And will you listen? Some of you will. Some of you won't. You know, that's that's the cycle of it. Yeah, because, I mean, look, we obviously read things off the Internet and everything else like that. Obviously, you lived your own life. Um, and it's, um, some of this stuff seems too crazy to believe. One of these articles here um, from St. Louis says that you completed <clears throat> thousands of capture or kill missions in your career, uh, sometimes capturing or killing several people in a single night. 
Um, have you been on thousands of missions? Is, is that something like that true? God, yeah. Um, that's an easier number than to try to remember the actual number. You know, um, <laughs> some nights you'll do a hit, some nights you'll do 10. Yeah. You know, those will roll into five the next morning, and then you'll do 10 more that night, and you do that 90 days at a time for 20 years, and they add up. There's guys now that since I've been out 10 years that have been at 10 more years of war that were just on my heels that have nonstop combat for 25 years. And it's just, it's, oh, this. Look at that's why these guys are killing themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot to deal with. That's a lot of people to try to help. You know, and I tell people the numbers of, I'll give you a round number since 9 11 to the same time period, like 2017, 5,665, right? And then I can give you 65,000. And, and I, I tell these guys, these new SF guys, what are those numbers? You know, once a combat death, once suicide. Well, 5,000 suicides, 65,000 combat deaths. I go, you wish. I go, I wish it was 5,000 suicides. 65,000 suicides of veterans, 5,000 <clears throat> combat related deaths in the same time frame. So we're killing ourselves at greater numbers than the enemy could a factor ever of 13. Even imagine to that's kill a, us at. It's a factor of 13. So. For every one person that dies in combat, 13 people kill themselves. Yeah, basically. and you were, you were pointing to yourself there when we were talking about the drugs and alcohol. Um, well, I've used them recreationally my entire life for a variety of reasons we've already discussed on the show. But yeah, I mean, I got into that too. It was the, 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 this was in mid-2000s to the 2010 area, and the VA basically was just like, here, take these pills and get the fuck out. Um, we don't have time for this bullshit. And then, you know, there's other factors. There's a lot of it is... Um, <clears throat> not unlike an athlete not wanting to come off the field like if i if i go on if i go take care of myself for a little while i lose my team mm -hmm. then i have to fight to get back to it and it, what if they die when i'm off my team that's not none of that shit is in no way is that acceptable to me but poisoning myself with pills is, was absolutely acceptable answer but there's a there's a there's a price to pay for that right so once you get on the tail end of it and the tempo starts to slow down you start to feel it and you're like oh shit i got to do something about this like I've got to take care of myself now, or I'm I'm going to be fucked. Right, right. So it's it is what it is. I I, I was lucky, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, to have experienced some of that stuff before, so I knew how to deal with it. But most dudes don't. They feel shame. They then then when they when the shame becomes so bad that they stop taking the medication, then all they all you feel is pain and shame all the time. What do you think is going to fucking happen? It's going to blow your goddamn brains out of your head. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean uh, with you personally. How do you come out of what you, if, if that, it's true, like you just said, thousands of, of missions, how, how do you walk away as a normal person after that? You don't. And I wish, I wish everybody would hear me. You don't. You cannot and you don't. And it doesn't take thousands of missions. It could be one mission. And, and I tell everybody, you know, PTSD is not held just for veterans, right? It's for anybody that, that goes through situations, um, first response, anybody, anybody that sees something horrible or has something bad happen to them. Now, if you do it over and over again for a period of years, now you got a complex PTSD and now it's a lot harder, but it, nobody comes out untouched. I mean, I'm talking your spouse, your kids, nobody, you got secondary PTSD at homes and veteran, veteran spouses kill themselves twice as much as civilian counterparts and veteran children, 17% higher suicide rates than their civilian counterparts you bring it home to the family you scream at the kids you scream at the wife and 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 just like ceos of organizations professional athletes anybody that dedicates their time to be really really good at something you give it up over here with your family and they don't know you and then when you go home you still take it out of your families and i mean there's lots of infidelity both sides everything and people turn to drinking on both sides and drugs and i'm not saying life's got to be a holy roller I'm telling guys, hey, moderation, man. You're killing yourselves when you're drunk out of your minds and you're feeling there's no more hope. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I want everybody to hear the story of veterans over and over again, starting with mine of almost killing myself, you know, just um, that shame of everything you've done. That hope is gone. You don't feel like you're worthy anymore and you don't feel like you belong to something better or bigger or contributing. So it all just comes crashing down on us and... Uh, you know, when I tell the story of, of people jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, not many survive. Mm. But those who do, to a person, said they regretted it the second their hand left the rail. So they would take it back if they could. So they really don't want to do it, you know? Yeah. We actually had that, uh, that sheriff, what's his name, Griggs? Kevin Griggs? Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy, the 
Golden Gate, whatever the fuck I can't remember his name. Briggs is it? Yeah. Briggs or Griggs? I uh, Briggs, I think. Yeah. We we do so many. We've <laughs> done like sixteen hundred episodes total here, but. Uh, um, yeah, he saved over 200 lives talking people down off mm. the Golden Gate Bridge. But you're right. It's exactly like you said. It's the people that have survived say the same thing. They're like, ah, shit. I, I regretted this, you know, right then and there. And, and obviously you can't bring people back from the dead to ask them their experience. But um, I think that's the closest you can probably get. Do you remember the first uh, time that you tried to kill yourself and when that was and what you were going through? Yeah, it was, um, I'd say six to seven years ago. Uh, we were in Ohio, we were working and I was on that down where I was getting another divorce. My kid wasn't talking to me. Um, we're doing an entertainment industry thing where we train civilians, how to put on the special ops gear, how to shoot weapons, which are airsoft, <laughs> you know, and then we'll teach them how to clear a building. And then, and then the zombies are coming and you gotta, you gotta make this hot zombie horde and kill the zombies. And and it was fun for a bit. And then one day it just hit me. I'm like, what am I doing? I, I'm glorifying killing. And this used to be fun. You know, this used to be my job. And now it's fun to me. And it's, it, I just, it hit me that I was like shamed that I was doing it. Felt like I wasn't contributing to anything better. And I would never have anything as good as I had had it in the past. And in that two block drive, um, two of my close friends in the back and a camera crew person in the front. Um, we had been riding back and forth for weeks now doing this job and um, pulled in the parking garage and, and I said, hey, I'll be in a minute. I got to make a phone call. And I was going to I was going <laughs> to kill myself. I was done with feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm just a burden, man. I'm just in the way. And uh, my two buddies took off, man, straight for the bar, which I normally would have done that, too. And the camera person was like, um, are you all right? She, she noticed something. I was like, I'm fine, fine. I just got to make a call. And what's going on in her head was, why is he not making a phone call from his room? Why is he doing it here? I mean, she noticed something different because she wasn't in that same bowl of shit that I had been living in like my buddies were, too. They didn't notice it on me either. And, uh, you know, I sat in the car and I, I put a brown in the chamber when they had left. And I thought, I remember thinking, I feel sorry for the rental car company. I really do. And then I remember thinking, um, do I put it in my mouth or the side of my head? And then a phone starts vibrating and just... it keeps vibrating keeps vibrating I'm like Jesus and I pick it up and all I saw was you're late and when that hit me I'm like I'm never late man no I'm fucking not gonna be late so I cleared my weapon put it back in my bag and stormed mm -hmm. off down to the lobby to find out what I was late for and it was just a tactic I found out later when I told her what I was doing that day like months down the road she was like I, I knew something was off normally you're responsive normally you know this and that so she noticed the small little things but it was just um a short amount of time that I, it all came crashing down and that lack of hope, you know, and it's, and that's why I tell everybody it, it only takes a second. If you reach out and check on people all the time, even though you think they're strong and good to go, send them a text, give them a call. You can change a life immediately that way. Yeah, uh, man, that's a <clears throat> crazy story to hear. Um, geez, I, you're right. Um, it's, it's one of those things where it seems so simple, but uh, you know, sometimes you overlook it because, of whatever's going on in the world of like, oh man, I've, I've got to go pick up that, that uh, last you know, set of Kiwi from, from the grocery store or whatever. It's just like, hey man, send a text real quick or shoot a quick call on the way down to the grocery store or whatever it is. But uh, when you put it, you know, hearing it out of your mouth um, is actually more helpful than that because it's one of those things you could write it a million times on Instagram, but right. you know, uh, hear, <laughs> hearing your story is better, obviously. Um, Get a tattoo it on a naked girl. That way, people read it. <clears throat> yeah, <know>. right. <laughs> it's all about marketing. It is. You go to Carrill's, dude. It'll be on his story. So, I'm sure it will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you get a naked girl <laughs> on there, um, one of the other crazier stories I, I'd love to talk to you about, which uh, I I wonder if you look back fondly or not uh, on this, is um, you were there um, walking into the room holding uh, the president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. Um, after his capture you now were you a part of that or did, did they call you in afterwards uh we were a part of it i my troop i was in charge of my troop uh was in charge of baghdad and another troop was in charge of the Tikrit area and that's where they operate and that's that's where i operated the night before we got saddam um we were looking for his handler who was supposed to have come to baghdad to have a meeting so i took my troop out and did a hit on a house and we caught that guy um caught the handler. I, I, I spoke to myself. He didn't give up any information. So I sent him on to the professionals, right? Go to bed that night and, uh, 
couple hours later, I, I get woken up. Hey, that guy you rolled up, <clears throat> he, he handles Saddam directly. And I go, yeah, yeah, I've heard this a thousand times, man. Let me roll back over and go to bed. Yeah. Like, no, no, we think this one's good. I go, you said that every other time, but I'll get up, you know. So we started our planning. It started looking real. You know, taking my entire troop up to, to crit that next that next day and we and planned for the hit that night and since it was to crit the troop that lived there got to pick which target there were two targets we were going to hit and one was out on the fish farm or one was out on the end of the field and the one was in town and you know the, the troop that was in there said they'll take the farm i don't know if they took it because they thought it was a hot topic or because the town was a little more dangerous because there's more windows to shoot out of but so we got sent to the town um the regular army kind of surrounded the town and make it look like they were locking it down. And I, I got to hit the cook's house who's faking a heart attack. He might have been dying. And he's telling me he knows where Saddam is. So I'm on the radio screaming to my boss, hey, I'm, I'm going to put this guy on the front of the vehicle. I'm going to tape him on there. He's going to point. We're going to steer and we're going to go get Saddam. He's, he's telling me, go home. Just go back to go back to the palace. I'm like, no, no, listen to me. We know where Saddam is. He's like, just return to the base. I'm like, shit, man. I'm so pissed off. Load up my guys. We go back to the palace, and uh, my boss is like, "Hey, come here." And he opens the door, and there's Saddam sitting at the table. I'm like, "Fuck!" He was at the other place, you know. So you roll the dice, and at the time, I didn't care if somebody knocked him over the head with a pipe and brought him in. I, I just wanted the guy caught so I could quit going looking for him and move on to like a target that mattered. Right. By the time you catch these these leaders, typically they don't matter anymore anyway. You know, somebody else has already taken over. But it was a good win. Um, been chasing the guy. You got him, and and I remember uh, being in the room with him, and uh, and I looked at him. He had a leaf sticking out of his hair, <laughs> his salt and pepper beard with dirty. And I go, he, he looks like Dirty Uncle Fester. I was talking like you know, like that that doesn't look like a president of, of Iraq. And he spit on me. And Saddam Hussein spit on your face? Oh yeah, <laughs> he had a good one right up across the table. And uh, yeah, I remember wanting to crush him. And I just, I just looked at him. I thought, well, anything that I do, I'm gonna get hammered for. You know, I'll probably go to jail for something. So I just looked at him. I go, it's cool, man. You'll be dead soon. And I just walked out of the room. And then we paraded him out through everybody and sent him on his way. But yeah, <clears throat> he was pretty. When, looking back at that, I remember. First of all, it's crazy you were there, and that was just, you were part of that. But I, I remember looking back at that, and um, it was one of those. You knew where you were when it happened. Uh, very similar to the, the Bin Laden killing. And uh, I also remember um, the video, that grainy video of him being led in to get hung where his head popped off of his body. Um, were you, it, do they let you in the room for that? No, I don't even know where I was when that happened. I remember seeing it going, whoa, whoa somebody's going to be pissed off about that video. Um, just thinking that would cause another civil war. I mean, that's where my head was at the time. I was like, oh, great. Now they're going to up. They're going to be rioting again. I mean, it's more U.S. servicemen that are going to get killed. But, um, I mean, they use shit like that all the time against each other to get them fired up. And then we're right in the middle, of course. So, yeah, I would have been cool to be there, but that was more of a national thing to do. Gotcha. I didn't know because you, you watch the footage, you know, as a civilian, you're like, man, I, I wonder who was in the room. I didn't know if you know who took the video or whatever, because that was another big story of like, well, who took this video? Who leaked this video? How did it get out into the world? Um, and then, you know, again, from a civilian perspective of watching it, uh, I remember, again, how defiant he was. And you always wonder if when these guys get captured or whatever, if they're cowering or whatever, you said that he had spit in your face. Uh, I know when they were walking him in and right before that they, you know, dropped him off the thing or pulled the lever on it uh, for him to get hung. He had said something else that was defiant too. Um, what was his last words, Hot Bob? Look that up. But uh, uh, <clears throat> do you remember thinking to yourself, how does this guy have it together enough to, be, to tell you to go fuck yourself and spit in your face during a moment like this? Because at this point, like you said, he's dirty as shit. He's been on the run for God knows how many months at that point. That would not have been my first instinct to do, but it was his. Yeah, narcissists are uh, always narcissists, I think. And then and people in power positions like that don't believe things will happen to them. I mean, he had been ruling all those years with an iron fist and nobody would even touch him or his family to the point of being in hiding, but yet def winning while you're not being caught, right? Up until you're caught. And 
And then knowing, everybody knows the Americans' rules, right? The Americans are the nice guys, minus the stories that we blast on the internet, you know, on the internet. But, you know, you can't touch me if I don't say anything in three days. I got to let you go, you know, and then they'll never beat you. They'll feed you. So <coughs> that, that plays a part in a lot of the defiance mm -hmm. um, of people knowing our, our rules of, of law and land warfare, you know, and then knowing how hard we'll fight because I don't want to be in an orange jumpsuit on a video anytime soon. So I'll fight to my death for that shit, right? Yeah. Yeah, I always say the same thing. I've got a number in mind. Like, if I had to go to prison past like ten years, I'd probably off myself and call it a day at that point. You know, I don't want to do go that. Start robbing banks or something. Yeah, <laughs> you'd go to shoot at or something. But I don't want to do that shit. Let me ask you: when you when you call home and you say, "Hey, man, I was I was one of the dudes who caught Saddam," what's that like for your parents and your family and and things like that? Are they proud of you? Uh, how does that work exactly? Or do you even tell them? Didn't tell him. I uh, I called home the next day on a satellite phone, and I think Michael Jackson was on trial. I don't. I don't remember what was going on at the same time. Dancing on top and of I his car. I, I called and I said, "Hey, turn on the TV and check out that Michael Jackson bullshit or something." And I remember my wife at the time turned on the TV and she goes, "Oh my god! Oh my god!" Because I knew it'd be on the news. And I go, "She goes, holy shit!" And I go, "Yep, tell everybody." And I hung up. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that's the only time I ever really mentioned it. Um, you go home, people know where you work and they know the deal. But for years, it was somebody else caught him. Somebody else did this. And, you know, until they allow you to talk about it and admit that you were the ones, some other organizations taking credit for it. And I think it's funny when they take credit for it in a general sense. That's great. Mm hmm. But when they take credit for it and then start bragging and then you get the guys that come out and start telling the stories about how I was there and I did this and that. And I'm like, now that's going a little bit too far because one day they're going to declassify that shit and you're going to look like a fool. And then when they declassify <laughs> and you come out like, they weren't even there. And those guys feel like idiots. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all the classification of when you can talk about it and then what you can say about it because of who it might hurt down the road, you know? So does this part of you, look at it of like, hey, man, if I told people about this right now, I could really cash in and get a monster book deal. Because that's what goes through my head when something like that happens where you're just like, oh, shit. And then because I remember with the Bin Laden thing, right? Um, I forget who the guy was who, who wrote the first book. Uh, <laughs> Mark Owen. Mark Owen. And he got <clears throat> $9.5 million advance. If memory serves me correctly. Did not bother going through the DOD for that and was sued promptly for $9.5 million. So uh, did not see a cent of that from what I heard. Real name is Matt Bezanet. Yeah. Um, but uh, w w was that a thought at all to be like, man, this is a pretty cool story. And I'm the dude who was there. And uh, I mean, let's face it. He's spitting your fucking face afterwards. That would have been worth easily $2 million advance. Yeah. Yeah. Um it was never a thought for me. It was, it was, it was a joke. Like, man, we need to cash in. We need to write that book quick, mm. you know, before the <clears throat> seal does. But that was always a joke from us, right? And then when I finally go to write a book, I've got my friends call me. I'm going, I heard you're writing a book, man. I'm like, yeah. And I go, what are you, a Navy SEAL now? I'm like, fire, fuck it is. There it is, you know. There's the joke. <laughs> I don't even know what the book's about yet. But did they forget that, uh, uh, did they forget that Eric Haney and, uh, and, and Colonel Grossman both wrote books? Like the right. first sergeant major yeah. and the fucking commander that started Delta yeah. both wrote oh, books. So it's like, yeah. what the hell, man? Come on. Yeah. It, you know what? You're always going to catch shit. And I wasn't even going to. I went. I worked with Intel in the unit while I wrote the book mm -hmm. all along the way. Right. Yeah. Everything. You know, they read the first run through. Like, can you please do this and this? And I go, sure. Can you do this and this? Yep. Did it. And they're like, perfect, man. Send it out. And everybody's. I heard rumors of everybody talking shit and trashing it. But. You know what? I would have too. Right? When I was in, I would have done the same thing. F you, man. I can't believe you're doing that mm. shit. I've been yelled at for talking and saying stuff, but people don't realize when they're in, you can't talk about it. When you're out, you can talk about it. Right? Yeah. That's just it. I'm not doing anything special anymore. I can talk about what I used to do, and I, I choose to do it and to help people, you know, not to cash in. Not that I would have cashed in anyway. I mean, I did write a book, and I don't know anybody buying it. It's, I mean, enough <laughs> buying it, but I don't know where that $9 million comes from. Jesus, I guess my story wasn't as grand as that one, but I haven't paid anything back yet either. So, <laughs> pretty happy about that. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we, we, it's interesting you say the Navy SEAL thing. That's, that was one of the lines in Matt's <clears throat> book. I helped uh, 
Matt Best write his his biography and and one of the lines is that is like relax Navy SEALs like other other people get to write books as well. Um, is it okay if we get in line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the, the interesting things that I told him because he was he had trepidation about talking about his life and being in service and all that stuff and a lot of these guys do. I, I my from a civilian's perspective, I said, look, man, if you put your life on the line every single day like that, um, because you, you guys aren't making a, a a you know a huge amount of money for doing what you do, and it's the most dangerous jobs on the planet. In my opinion, from a civilian standpoint, you deserve to cash in uh, at some point and be like, hey, man, I did all of this awesome shit. I put my life on the line every day. My personal life is a goddamn nightmare. Yeah, let's make a little money and at least enjoy some of this, right? Yeah, everything's a train wreck except what I used to do. Um, yeah, we're the worst. We trash our own so fast, you know. And guys used to talk about writing books and be like, you fucking loser, you know. And then <laughs> you're going to ruin the secret. And then I wrote a book and I'm like, I'm, like, I'm a fucking loser. But, you know, my friends used to talk about writing books. And, and then when I wrote mine, I've had four other people from Unis saying, hey, man, how'd you do it? I want to do it. So more and more people are starting to do it. They realize that that whole secrecy thing is great when it matters, mm -hmm. when it protects people. But when it's just something that you're using to call people names because, you know, you can't write a book about what you did. Why not? Yeah. Because you get people killed. How? Mm -hmm. I mean, Somalia was quite a long time ago. Yeah. Um, things have changed. I hope there's no Somalia that was there that's still alive today that was a bad guy. I hope they all died that day anyway. But and there's always a reason someone's going to be pissed off. And I've, I've learned, uh, you know. I've learned to forgive myself of the worry I used to have about everybody else's feelings. I just, uh, I just choose to do what I think is right and keep going at that. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, the book is called All Secure. Um, it's also the the name of your foundation, the All Secure Foundation. Um, and this was started with you and your wife Jen, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, tell the audience a little a little bit about the foundation and what you guys do. Yeah, All Secure Foundation. We we run retreats for special operations to combat warriors and their families four-day workshop retreats that help them with their relationships and help them understand what ptsd is we didn't want to just help veterans because a lot of people already do that um we wanted to help the family because we know when a lot of these veterans get help or go on a hunting trip or go to disney they end up going home they still have the problems that they have we want to help the spouse understand what's what her veterans what their veterans going through we want to help the veteran understand what their spouse has been going through because we kind of neglect those thoughts you know oh, you're the housewife that's an easy job <laughs> right it's real easy to raise children that's uh my god that's why we don't want to do it i'd rather go to war right but and we try to get them talking again because when you're when you're apart that long their relationship falls apart right mm -hmm. and, and when you don't flirt with each other you don't date with each other you don't you don't tell each other you look pretty, someone else is going to do it at some point, and that's going to feel good. And then your relationship starts to split. And what we get from 90% of who we talk to is, please help me with my relationship, and please help me with my anger management or my lack of understanding how to communicate with people, with children, with my family. So we help them. We give them tools. We work with them on the retreat. Then they go out and they, have some, they do something fun. Probably twice a day they're doing some interactive thing. You know, it's an experiential retreat where they're using the tools that we and our counselor have given them. And along with that, we're doing over the phone counseling during COVID. We've been doing it for free for veterans and first responders. We added first responders during COVID because they're working so hard. And, and we know everybody needs to sit down and just talk to somebody about the stress and pressure of what's going on in their lives. And so we do that. Um, we've done some online courses that we're getting ready to release. That'll be... We're figuring out how to how to how to launch, launch it. Will it be free for veterans? Will we, you know, have some skin in the game? Will we charge civilians? Because everybody needs this, and everything we do to include my book and my my wife wrote a book that's coming out in February is to go back to the foundation to help people in need, to help the combat warriors that 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 need it so much. And we literally nonstop on the phone helping people day in and day out. And I still have more time to help people. Is it you that's answering the phone, you and your wife? Um, Me and my wife, and we have a therapist, and we have two other um, volunteers that help when our when our call volume gets up too high. Yeah, so that's crazy. And then I, we have our couple of admin people that that help out mm -hmm. that help us with the paperwork, so we can stay on the phone more often. But yeah. 
I, I, I just, uh, the, the crazy part about it to me is, you know, going through what you've gone through um, overseas and in all these missions and everything else, um, as if it's strange or, you know, kind of reflective of what you went through every single day uh, when you hear these stories day after day after day. One would imagine that you wouldn't want to do something like this anymore because of what you went through. Um, why is it different for you personally and your wife? Because I'm sure she went through this with you. Because you're right. It is not just you. It is often the, the wives, the kids, everybody else. Um, and, uh, and I agree with you 100% on saying, look, being a, a great mom to your children is the hardest job in the world. Um, it's easier said than done. But look, during COVID, spend time with a couple young kids. Like, dude, you, you realize how difficult it is. Uh, I'm curious as to why you guys decided to answer the phones personally during this. Because that is a job you could have left for someone else to do. I think more people listen from our experience. Um, I'm, I'm never, I've never been the one to, I was in Delta, so listen up, you know. I've, not, I've never been that guy, but I've been told repeatedly, hey, these guys look up to you, these people look up to you. They wanted to do that job, they didn't do that job. Um, and my wife's saying, hey, listen, if people are looking at you, they're listening to you too, so put out this message they need to hear. And so if... They're going to listen. I'm going to give them give the message that they need to hear. And it's it's hard answering the phone every day. It's hard um, scheduling these calls because I know it's going to be the same story over and over again. I cheated on my wife or me and my wife aren't doing well or I drink all, you know, guys like, hey, I drink a fifth a night. I, I'm not good at this. And I go, you sound like you're pretty fucking good at it, man. Drinking a fifth a night. You're good at this. <laughs> shit. You know, and they, they want to stop and they can't. I hear it in their voice. And when they finally call me. If they start crying for 30 minutes, I'm like, go ahead, man. It feels good to feel, you know, get it out. And I don't, I don't think I ever want to stop. As scary as it is to call each time and get on the phone each time and start over each time and to hear the same sadness, I also hang up the phone here and hope every time. So it's not therapy. I'm, I can help retrain your brains. I can help, I can help with the muscle memory we've developed with hate and anger getting us through, right? Violence and aggression gets us by. And these warriors like to dominate the situation. The kids leave the clothes on the floor, the dishes in the sink. They come in and freak out, just like the combat situation. And then they back off and they assess it, but it's too late. The kids don't understand that initial freak out part. They don't really want that. You know, and I hear from spouses, I'm not your private all the time. So, you know, we interact how we know we interact. We, we interact what we're good at. And now we're trying to help these warriors understand, hey, it's a different world out here now relax a little bit man not everything's going to get you killed you know but it's biological so it takes time to retrain that brain and um break that muscle memory just like you developed it it takes pretty much about that amount of time to get rid of it over and over and over again but it's doable yeah uh how do you think the the negativity of the covid impact has had on these guys coming home so let's say you just got out and then all of a sudden boom covid hits and then you're stuck inside all day with this uh, are you getting calls like that where it's just like, man, I have nowhere to go. Well, I can tell you one from a friend of mine that's coming home from an undisclosed location right now. You get mid tour leave in the middle mm -hmm. of a 12 month or longer deployment, sometimes nine. It depends on uh, which unit you're in or what the, the length is and, and all that shit. But uh, they're going to have to they're, they're going to get about 10 days. But uh, I think six of those are basically spent in some kind of transitional period. And you have to quarantine for a while before you redeploy. You know what I mean? Ugh, it's fucked right now. That's not, that's just people that are in mid service. If you're coming back, like you want to come back and enjoy life a little bit after you've almost died a bunch of times. In a mm -hmm. And uh, that's not going to be possible for some folks, depending on where they live, right? Like if you live in, if you're stationed in California, you might be fucked yeah. for a little while, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, quarantine's fucking everybody over with coming home. Yeah. They don't have the time to come home now because they got a quarantine. So why bother yeah. coming home? You know, why bother traveling? Most people are like, screw traveling. I don't want to quarantine anyway. So, yeah, it's, it's, I think a lot of them have uh, midterm leaves have been just removed. Screw it. You're not even going yeah. anywhere because you can't come back and give us COVID. We can't lose you for another two weeks, you know, here and there. So, yeah, it's been depressing for these guys and gals, man. It's, um, you know, like I said, suicides have gone up from 22 to 28 a day during COVID alone. Um, people are isolated and locked in, and then they're told they have COVID. You can't do anything, and they're stuck in the barracks. Right. You know, it's uh, some guys are lucky enough to have money, and their units can ship 
you know, weight equipment over to their barracks. And they, guys were working out three times a day when they had COVID. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a horrible disease for some and it's, it's not for others. But other units that don't have that money, guys are just locked in and it's quiet and it's, it's really sad. And it's going to be hard to come back to because it's been this long. Everything that's new is weird. Mm -hmm. New will be going back to normal, and that'll be weird again for a while. So it'll be slow, another slow process. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you guys start this, by the way? What year was this? Oh, God. Um, 15. So I think we started in 15 is when we started putting it together. And then about three years ago was when it really started working and, and, and we started getting money, you know, instead of our own money, we started getting donations and people started trusting what we were doing and we started putting it on. And we had uh, eight retreats scheduled this year. Oh, wow. And, they, and they, sold, they, they sold out. They booked up in about four hours. And then every one of them except one was canceled this year. So they've been pushed to 2021. And we're hoping to be able to do one a month at a minimum. Along, because in, in, in the middle, we go and we speak to military units on resiliency training. So we go speak to the new SF guys and the guys who just graduated over and over again all year long and other military units as well. So it's kind of like we're going to have to start hiring people once we get a little more money. It's all scalable. So we're at that breaking point of exploding, hopefully. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I was uh, going through some old articles before you came on the air. Um, and, uh, there was a, a quote of yours, um, from the past that said, I have uh, very little patience. Who knows what I said, <laughs> said, I, knows what I said in the past, Exactly. Man. Uh, one of them was, I, I have very little patience, uh, and I probably have zero empathy. Um, obviously that was, that was from a while ago. Uh, clearly you have empathy now for all of these people. How is your life today? Are you completely happy every single day or do you have uh, bad days and bad thoughts still? Yeah, uh, bad days and bad thoughts still, um, but a lot less. And it's a lot better. I tell you what, I lived miserable. I didn't want to get out of bed. You know, when you don't want to get out of bed and you hate the work week and you can't wait to the weekend, I, I got that way. And now it's like, I don't have a work week really, but... Um, I got to the point where I was like excited to go back to work. You know, I was excited to get out of bed in the morning and, and liked what I do. And, you know, it, it is. <laughs> it's tough, man. It's, it's tough to. Uh, you know, push past some of that stuff when you see guys that, that, you know, need help and they and they just keep lying to you about how tough they are. You know, I'm good, man. I've seen so many therapists. I'm probably a doctor myself. All the jokes are funny. They're all funny. But when somebody really needs some help and you know it and they won't take it, it's just, it's, it's scary as shit, man. But day to day, man, I've never been happier. Uh, my wife's opened me up to so many different things in the world. And uh, I'm so much more relaxed. I'm so much better with the children. You know, my stepkids, I, I'm, I got a 21-year-old son. I'm still trying to get to talk to me, right? But that was my shit that I earned along the way of always being gone. So we'll get on that, but I get a chance to try to do it again and I feel like I'm doing it better and it's, it's, uh, it's a lot better now. Uh, have you had calls in the future, like years later of people calling <laughs> saying, Hey man, you saved my life that night. Yeah, man. So many already. It's, it's, that's, that's why we do it. I mean, it's such sad work that if we didn't get feedback, it would probably beat us up fast. Um, but I get so many messages. Uh, I got one today, a guy that just got off their therapist. She's a unicorn. I got fucking told you she's a unicorn, man. You know, he's like, I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to do this. I didn't think. And I never told a combat story, but she told me to explain it to her in detail. And I swear to God, I've never felt this way in my life. And I go, told you she's a fucking unicorn, man. So it's just when we get those messages, calls and from around the world, man, it's uh that's the reason to keep going. Um, can you remember one of the craziest you've had? The craziest? Mm -hmm. Like, did somebody call you from a roof or something like that? No, I, I, we, we're careful to let people know we're not a 911 center. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want the, I can't have the liability of that, and I can't always be there. Um, and, it, and early on, it really freaked me out. People would call two in the morning and, and they're typically drunk. And, and I was typically drunk too. So I didn't want to help people. But when I wasn't drunk and they were, it's hard to help somebody who's drunk who wants help 
now because they're drunk or drinking. And yeah, when they sober up, they don't want it. But I mean, I've I've had people call me that were very very scary, like, "Hey man, I'm on," you know, the mellow kind. I'm cool. I'm in a hotel room, just chilling. Just want to say hey. And I'm like, uh, you know, this is not normal. This is this is not normal. But um, nothing crazy. It's always just, you know, pay a. I just I need help, so they know they want help. They've given in to wanting help, and and the ones that the ones that would call and say that you know they need it right now. I just I I can't. I've had I've had a crazy one. It was a, it was a Facebook search. It was a guy that was talking about killing himself on a Facebook live video and, and uh, people were starting to try to figure out who it was. Mm. And we were going through <clears throat> sending messages about where's the location? It was Vegas. Okay, backdrop. Try to figure out what hotel. Now let's send the cops. And we got that person, um, some security that got to him. He was just drunk, just not talking shit, but they got him, you know, they got him some help and mm. nothing happened. Wow, that's <clears throat> nuts, man. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I ask when, when you have a job, because uh, this is your job, that is that yeah, you know, boy, I don't want that nine one one center stuff. Ah, man. yeah, what's uh, like? But it's still pretty intense, man. I mean, when you hear that, it's like, hey, what do you tell people? Like, dude, you got to call somebody else, or do you you call for them? Like, you know? No, uh, we always talk them through, it, and it, I've never <clears> had one that's like I got the gun in my mouth right now. You know, I well, my buddy, one of the first ones. You know, he was he was on crack heroin fucking alcohol and everything and and he's like i can't pull the trigger anymore but i got a, i got the gun and i'm gonna do it now you know and i'm, I'm like oh, okay tell you what we'll get you the help tomorrow i promise and i, I mean we got him like seventy five thousand dollars from one guy overnight that sent him and saved his life and they're always tense and scary <laughs> i tell you um but i don't want that kind of you know you get into a real touchy thing there because People who are going to do it are going to do it. Mm. They've made up their mind. They're going to do it. Those people typically don't call somebody and right. ask and start a conversation. They're just going to do it. Man, um, what do you do to unwind after a job like this? Like, I'm always curious. Uh, you know, I mean, you're hearing the worst stories on the planet every single day. Like, what does a guy like you and your wife do to unwind after all of this? Uh, and how do you not take it to bed with you every night? Oh man, you know, we talk a lot with each other. Um, we've learned to spend a lot of time together. Uh, I've learned not to drink past. I'll set it if it's two or three, you know, I'm a vodka, I'm a Tito's guy. I'm seeing that bottle right there. My mouth's starting to water and shit. I'm like, <laughs> that time, man, um, I used to drink that whole bottle and then still not wake up at the hangover. That's why I love Tito's. But now I've learned to not go past that point And we talk about it. You know, not like it hurts me this and because you get used to everything, right? Mm -hmm. You get used to everything. Sadly, you get used to hearing these stories over and over, and they don't affect me as much because it's almost like a, a joke. I'm like, hey, you know, keep going. You forgot a couple symptoms, you know. Did you cheat on your spouse? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. There's another one, uh, you know, risky behavior. But it's almost like a joke because I, 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 I turned it to focusing on the healthy side, the, the getting better side. So we tell jokes and we crack jokes about it. like Matt Bess, you know, he sells coffee and he helps people, but it's a fun thing. He gets to make crazy videos and have a good time. I'm like, I can't go on and go, Hey guys, don't shoot yourselves today. You know, it's, it's hard to make it funny and interesting, but we're trying to just focus on the healthy, happier side of, of how you felt, you know, and, and not on the, uh, poor me. I'm going to shoot myself in the face every day thing. Cause that gets real depressed. It's like watching the news, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no news is good news, or they never put it on the news because it's boring for people. They want to see all tragedy. Of course, of course. Uh, you know what's funny is like uh, looking through old pictures and and all that stuff of you personally, uh, the way you look now physically. Uh, you're the type of dude if you if you saw in a bar, you would have no idea uh, what you went through, or that was the guy who got you know Saddam Hussein and all that other stuff. Um, <laughs> do you did you change your body? Uh, intentionally um because you were a monster <laughs> you mean, a lot of weight? yeah i mean dude you were I, like i'm looking at you right now from the past and like jesus christ if i ran into you out in a bar holy fuck i would go the other way man um that was my iraq years um it took a lot to get up to that that was post somalia years i came into the unit at 150 
I could run, I would run, I would ride my bike 20 miles to work. I'd run 10 miles at work and then ride my bike home after working out twice that day. I, I didn't give a shit. I just, you couldn't stop me. And then one day, uh, two years into the unit, a friend, we were up running selection and a friend walked up and he goes, hey, you got a string on your shirt. And he pulled it and he goes, oh no, that's your arm. And I went, oh, okay, <laughs> fucker. So I started eating Joe Weeder weight gain and working out for 10 years. And finally, after about 15 years, I got up to 250. Yeah. I mean, in Iraq, everybody's growing their hair and their beards and shit. I was 250, shaved my head. I was clean shaven. And I'd go in there, I'm not the good American you're looking for, you know, and I'd scare these people. But that 250 also meant I couldn't <clears throat> run anymore, you know. So I decided uh... to try to get it back down to a, a, a size that didn't hurt my body mm. anymore. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hovering around 210. I'd like to be at 200 again. I think that's a little natural for me. So that was a knee-jerk reaction to being made fun of for having little arms. And I spent like 15 years working out and shit. And I've spent the last 10 not working out. So it's going away, you know, and I'm not jacking the weights anymore. So That's hilarious. Plus, <laughs> yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at these old pictures and it's like, this is America's worst nightmare. I will fuck you. Like... That's, I was like, holy shit. And when you popped up on the screen today for everybody's watching on YouTube, subscribe, by the way, to Drinking Bros yeah, Podcast. His little brother. Yeah, his little brother. that's what I was like, yo, is this the same fucking person? Or they, did they get this wrong? Um, you, you got catfished, man. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you ate another one of yourselves and you were just <laughs> kicking down they used doors. They baby Hulk back in the day, man. And then it was, uh, you know, that was the heyday. I just, my job was to go around and scare the bad guests I tried. Mm. Well, Jesus Christ, I'm sure you did a good job of it. If I, if you would have kicked down my door and I saw you over there, I don't give a shit what you asked for. Uh, I probably would have given you my butthole virginity. Well, um, I mean, geez. You would have, you need a time machine to do that, my man. <laughs> it was many. The funny thing is during those times, I would be about the 15th guy through the door. I'd have, I'd have 15 screaming commandos in front of me the younger guys with all you know they're 150 pounds or whatever and then i'd walk in right behind them give me all the detainees i want to talk to you people you know i'm going to find out what you know and and that was my job at that time I, my years of kicking doors were over so i just walked in bulky and big and like baby hulk's here to mess with you guys and i'd start off with tell them i'm not the good american they were hoping for and then i'd just start asking questions just trying to scare the shit out of them uh, that's great <laughs> it would have worked i'm looking at these and i'm like jesus christ uh <laughs> you know um it's, it's like a like jocko or something today you know like that guy's gonna fucking tear my arms off today well, you don't need arms no no you don't need arms um this is the point in the show we get to the drinking bro of the week which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to Mm, wow um person who made me who i am today you know what i'm gonna do something probably weird and awkward and give it to my wife man she's <laughs> she's the reason i'm here today she is my drinking bro and she's the one who i mean she's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with me in my worst nights and stood out and fought back and and is still here so you know that'd be that'd be, that'd be for her that's awesome cheers uh did she know all of the things that you had done when you met her? No. I think when she was brought up to be introduced to me, I didn't want to meet her. I was in a bad headspace. Mm. And they were like, hey, this guy's a legend, blah, blah, blah. He was in Black Hawk Down. He did this. And he, you, you, know, you ever heard of Delta Force? She's like, is that like the Navy SEALs? And he went, oh, fuck off. You need to go read this book. And then she came in. I mean, she knew nothing about it. But, I mean, that's, that's good, right? It is, yeah. Why professionals? You know anything about us. I'm like, here we go. Yeah, because I, I always assume the opposite, Dan, where it's just like if you knew what, what somebody had gone through, like somebody like you or Dan or anybody else, right, uh, it would almost make you turn the other way and be like, well, I don't want that baggage. I'm all good to go here. Um, and the fact that she's you know, stayed in it uh, this long and you guys have this crazy, intense, um, you know, all secure foundation together is, uh, is pretty amazing, man. That's, a, that's definitely a keeper, you know? Oh yeah, I, yeah, I can't, I can't get rid of her. She's, uh, <laughs> she's been uh, the best thing that's ever happened to me. I know it sounds, I, I've heard that before, but seriously, I've been married a lot, and she, she's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and and set me straight. I mean, the first person to actually set me straight and not just let me run wild. Man, um, you you mentioned she wrote a book, and it comes out in February. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's called Arsenal of Hope, and it's um, kind of her side of my story, if you will, like the spouse side of dealing with some crazy fucker who 
never is wrong and he doesn't think he's ever wrong and drinks himself to death and and does shitty things to her and then what what caused it and how to how to get past it i mean since everything that we talk about with everyone is relationship 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 you know she thought we need to put out the other side of it um so i think it's i think it's for the, the warriors to read too because they need to understand you know their spouses and it's for the spouses how to understand their warrior and uh, what they go through awesome Awesome, man. Uh, where can everybody find you? And is there a number that people can call to reach out to you? Um, how do they How do they find you online? We have people reach out at allsecurefoundation.org. dot org. Okay. Jen and I both get those emails. It's either if you go on and you, you want help, you can reach out there at allsecurefoundation dot org. If you can reach out on Instagram or Facebook, we're All Secure Foundation. You know, and uh, Twitter haven't <laughs> figured it out yet. We're on there at All Secure Vets, but I don't I don't delve in that, but Anytime anybody needs anything, they can reach out at any one of those platforms and we get right back with them and then I'll find out what they need. I'll give them my personal cell phone at the time. I'll either connect them with our therapist right away or I'll talk to him right away or my wife will talk to him or we'll talk to the couple together. I mean, I tell them there's there's no configuration that you can't come up with that we can't do to help you and your and your spouse, you know, get some help together. We'll do it together, do the counseling separate and then come together. You know, we got retreats, we've got courses online that are coming and then there's videos on there of, of us and other people who've gone through the same thing so awesome awesome well tom uh you're a hell of a guy man <clears throat> we appreciate you being on it's our first episode of of 2021 hopefully this year ends up being uh better than last year uh for tom satterley d'anthony d'anthony holloway i am ross patterson this is the drinking bros good night everyone